there's a lot of stuff going on in the urban communities that precede folks being able to um, take a look at what's going on outdoors or stepping out of the box. The Environmental Awareness Network is a program that we started some years back, having seen that uh, I was a gang prevention coordinator in the Boys and Girls Club, and that youngsters were going into the computer room, into the gym, and not talking to each other. There was no social skills going on. But I was the kind of guy with, and they called me the brother with the funny cap and the kayak on, his, on, on top, and the boat on top of his car. I was a kayaker, and I mentioned Vietnam because Vietnam, when I came back, I really, really struggled with what's called post-traumatic stress disorder. And when I came back as a youth counselor and did some things and got some therapy with that and got some help and some counseling with that, it was suggested that I do the isolating thing, the appropriate isolating thing and meditating thing by getting into the outdoors. Someone prescribed outdoors for me as a post-traumatic stress person. And the kayak and the canoeing and the camping is what won me my peace and my balance. And I saw that happening even when Microsoft came in with all the computers into the Boys and Girls Club. Kids got on it with excitement level, but by six months they were all, they were doing doomy.com and something else. They were going nuts with each other and they weren't going outdoors. They were plugged in and they were getting more plugged in and more wired than ever. And their social skills were going down. They weren't even going into the gym anymore. They were waiting behind each other in line to get on the computers to do something that was not necessarily academic. So I'm going to approach my EANDC and using the power of nature to transform urban youth as something that is important to understand that our youngsters are starting from a deficit when we talk about urban youth connecting with the outdoors. There's not a sense of place all the time for our youngsters who are coming from single parent households, uh, who don't have role models in the outdoors for them, who are, like I say, they are angry, they don't get angry, and they come from a lot of things but not being able to articulate, identify, and say what they feel. They just do. Championing the movement, and I got that too, always smiling, to leave no child inside, we've got a process working with our urban youth called programs, partnerships, hooks for the underserved, and pipelines to higher education entrepreneurship. Our youngsters want sneakers and things and want to know they can go somewhere else besides just to school and out or just in the community where from three to six, there's nothing going on. A lot of community centers, if you, don't, you can't pay, you can't get in. If you get in, you got to belong to a set or a clique or somebody else is a, a notion. So pipelines to high schools, from high schools to entrepreneurship and colleges and, and other quality of life issues are real important for our youngsters and for the program that we have. I was here a few, a few months back, maybe last year actually, uh, at, and um, Richard Louvre, who started the movement of uh, Leave No Child Inside, really inspires me. I, I um, was here and talked about some of the hooks that we use. And lo and behold, a few weeks later, I was called to be uh, a part of the board of the Children Nature Network. So I'm blessed and pleased that, that that kind of movement is being had and nationwide and maybe even international things are happening to bring more information about young folks getting outdoors. I work for the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation and the EE summer camps are the, are the camps that I am hired to increase the diversity of the camps so that they look like what the communities of New York look. They were really, really, really uh, um, charged with some rural youngsters that were needing camp but that there was a face that was not brown, Latino, or in a city that was in the camps. And so the four camps, three of them for 12 to 14, and one for 15 to 17, is sort of like my feeding place, where I get uh, most of my youngsters from and their friends who buy into the peer attraction that comes from seeing youngsters go outside, hike, bike, row, and ski, and then be attracted to, as opposed to peer pressure, pushed away from what it is that we're doing as a group. Encouraging urban youth and underserved youth to connect with the natural world. This is one of the, the things, some youngsters in, in, in our communities, and this is real, they're, they're, they're okay with gunshots, fire engines, police officers, police shots, people running, but they're afraid of the quiet. And ice fishing, that's one of the things one of these young men said, man, it's, it's too quiet out here. 
you know. But they were excited about the new adventure of doing something out of the box and ice fishing. So we, you could, I, I'll give you a story, uh, or, or one that I tell pretty often, working in the Boys and Girls Club and gang prevention. I had a young man, and this is how it is in the hood now. He came in and said, I'll sign up for the canoe trip, but I ain't giving you my whole government. And that, that means something. He's not giving you your whole, his whole name. He doesn't want to go, you know, and that's a, that's a hit in the city about trust. They don't want to even give you the whole name when they're signing up for things. So I said, well, give me any name, man. He said, well, my name, they call me Shorty Big Drawers. <laughs> that was his street name, Shorty Big Drawers, because he wore his pants down, you know? So I said, okay, Shorty, sign up, man. We're going to go. And he signed up, and at 6.30 in the morning the next day he came. He showed up on time to go camping for three days in Old Sable Castle up in the Adirondack. When we get up there, I had fishing rods and a couple of stacks of dozens of the night crawlers. Well, Shorty Big Wars was afraid to put a worm on a hook. But he was locking the block down. You couldn't play basketball unless you got his permission. And he was that kind of guy. But our campfire talk was about giving yourself permission to be an adolescent. And that's some of the first things that have to happen with some of our kids, to give themselves permission to play to do unstructured stuff, to be for real, to understand that what they're feeling inside and what they're thinking inside is okay to let it come out if you're in the right atmosphere with the right peer group around you and the right atmosphere to explain it and uh, really let that happen. And this is, this is the group in Osable Castle. Shorty Big Draw is not on this particular book because we had two, but this is the kind of, of faces that happen once you get past that that jockeying for a position and things like, I, I don't want to do this. I'd rather rap or play basketball. I ain't into that outdoor stuff, my man. And they would say to Brother Yusuf, I can do this, I can do that, but I ain't, I ain't with that. You know, the water, no, nah, I ain't with that. But when they get out there, I've seen youngsters who wear their $200 and $150 white sneakers, just let it go and jump in the water and chase salamanders in the mud the second day that we're out there. We'll let it all go. Community outreach and education, and the Leave No Child Inside movement is really, really what it's about, getting youngsters outdoors, regardless of what age they are and how they are. I actually work with a lot of groups, and my wife is a pre-K teacher, so I'm there. And I remember when I got hooked as, as a closet environmentalist, is when my teacher gave me a, the red milk carton and a lima bean and some dirt. I got hooked. I was hooked from then. And then my, 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 one of my brothers inherited a small fish tank and I was able to raise guppies and stuff. Things like that are just turning points. But uh, the community outreach that we do with education starts with partnerships and that's part of my first P and the PPHP piece, partnerships. And in the school district, my youngsters that go to camp that I enlisted from 12 to 14 and 15 to 17 are in a partnership with a, a literacy program for reading. And these are some of the programs that we do. And in that partnership, what they're doing, the high school students, these are experienced campers that have been out hiking and biking with me, that have done the, the environmental education camp for a week, and the Commission of New York is allowing me to give out free scholarships to encourage this, of the, uh, uh, this increasing of the diversity of our camps. But those youngsters come out, and they come out and, and, and influenced by what they've done and what they've seen that's new. Some of them get a hunter safety license, they learn a lot about aquatics. They learn a lot about uh, renewable energy, recycling, and those things that come out, they want to give it away. So there was a reading program that was reading a lot of just the regular Dick and Jane books and other things that were being done that asked me if I could encourage a better start in that for a summer program uh, that was about enrichment because it was post-Katrina and they wanted to know more about the environment. Long story short, I was able to hire and get the, the funds through another partnership to hire six high school kids that have gone to camp to become tutors to the youngsters that were in the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade at an elementary school. So at 3.30 when they got out of school, instead of going right home, they took the bus, special bus that, that routed themselves back to the two together on the other side of South Town and are now reading and teaching kids how to read but they're using the contents of the books are the acorn naturalists about bees, leaves, trees, honeybees, pollinators. Uh, Ranger Rick is their monthly uh, periodical that comes in. And the ultimate journey after reading on the thematic thing, if we're talking about trees, the ultimate journey is to go to a forest preserve and learn and talk about trees. That's a Saturday trip that's done every three weeks after we have a, a, a thematic reading on that. But these are 
high school kids who are learning how to, instead of just get a McDonald's job, but how to become environmental educators to other youth and do a service learning project as a, to reaching back to that youth and, and preparing them for what's coming in their lives uh, as far as being outdoors for them. Again, life is better on the outside is what the key is. And it's actually integrating a lot of the New York State standards for education into some of this. A lot of this, and you'll see, and I'll, I'll speed up a little bit on the process of the frames, but you'll see that there is a beginning, a middle, and an end to some processes that have to be respected when it comes to trust. Who are you talking to me about doing outdoors? I'm, you, I, I'll give it to you. I work with the New York State DEC, and when I, go, when I, when I started there, I was the only African-American on my division of public affairs and education floor. The second person that was there was my unit director from Boys and Girls Club, who I hired a year later to come in. So the faces don't look like the kids that they're trying to attract. And if you go into a high school or an elementary school or middle school, I'm not going in the woods with you, man. <laughs> you know, the stranger danger and some other stuff. And you don't look like me. And there's nothing that connects me to you as far as trust. And you don't understand that my sister's 19 and that my mom is going to a sixth boyfriend. And you don't understand that this is going on and that my brother wants to, he keeps taking my sneakers and I want to beat him up. And you don't understand that I can't just walk off my block and go on any block I want to go to because there's territorial issues in the hood. We don't understand all that all together from an experiential point of view. So a lot of youngsters are not going to go out and, and do the outdoor thing with you until they establish trust, see the examples, and understand that what they're going to get out of this is something more than what they would get from other places. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big piece of regards to trust and having folks connected. And for me, I can't go to the third, fifth, and sixth graders necessarily and capture them in their attention. But I can get a high school who's closer to the age to sit down with them, who's been there who's done some turkey hunting, who's done some skiing, who's done some kayaking, and talk to them about the adventures that are in that, and they win them into what our whole arena is about, so that leadership becomes a trickle-down piece and a trickle-up uh, adventure. These are the partnerships that we make, identifying ways for the communities to benefit from nature play. And we're talking about unstructured play. I'm not talking about, let's start a soccer team, so there can be this kind of structure, though all that has its place. I'm talking about, here's the sandbox, here's the tools, here's this, let's have some fun. Here's the water, what do you want to do? You want to fish, you want to swim, or do you think you want to get in the kayak? Choices, options that they have to have that leads into them being able to be better decision makers and have more about a say-so in what they do. My biggest piece to any audience is always that when you're working with the urban youth, start where they stand. Don't start where you're coming from, start where they stand. And always do that. Sense of awe, sense of wonder, sense of place. I heard that before. And some of these young folks have been locked into some cities and some stuff where all they see is cement and things torn down. Or if at best, they're not able to go outside because grandma who's raising them, not mom, but grandma who's raising them won't let them go outside And when it gets this way. I won't let them go but two blocks from where they live. Things like that happen in the, in the, in the, in the city. But this is the Moreau State Park. We actually did some reading on the beavers, three, th a whole week of reading on the beavers and the beaver being the New York State animal and the whole thing about that and took a beaver walk, a beaver trail walk at Moreau State Park led by an interpreter and an intern that's very well versed on what's going on at that park. And these kids were stopping him and pointing out things that they knew about and wanted to know more about because they had read about it. And they had, they had experienced it with someone else who had been outdoors. And this is the group that went out there. This is where our future environmental students will come from. I believe that we can give them and lower the wing of understanding and connection to them. Again, the, the kind of free play, unstructured play is really, really important. I've seen basketball. I've seen dancing groups, step teams. I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen midnight basketball try to win over the urban youth, and, 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 and a lot of that has its place. But when I, when I see unstructured play and youngsters going out and putting up a tent or having a bucket with water and some sticks in it and doing their own thing, it brings out the creativity, the smartness, the, the, the social skills of having something to talk about. 
When we go on our, our excursions, we, we always unplug these kids. No iPods, no Walkmans, no anything, even on the vans going. It's all about conversing with each other. But unstructured play is very, very important in the life of our kids. Now, we're talking about structure, but unstructured. When it comes to kayaking, all hands down, Brother Yusuf is there. Kayaking is my middle name. And being in the water and knowing that it's a meditation as well as a recreation is real important to get that across to the youngsters. That they can lose themselves in the oneness of the kayak, in the oneness of the paddle, in the oneness of being connected to the water that close. In the team building that comes from the first time I put a youngster in the, the kayak, it's in a pool where he's used to being. He doesn't understand the duck muck of the lakes. He understands the pool. And the first thing that these kids do as far as trust, I want you to fall out of the kayak. And they learn new skills, not just the kayaking, but they learn about accepting quiet, accepting leadership, and how to do the certain things that relate to so your partner can save you in the pool. And that's the first element of trust, that he can trust his partner, to know how to take that kayak over his kayak and get the water out and then help him get back in by steadying it. And so they become the team building from the first impression of what it is to do this small um, water sport, small craft water sport. So that's important. And then we go out to the lakes with the best instructors. And we take small groups for full days. We don't do the fresh air fun. I'll say we're doing it because some program coordinator says you have to do this on Saturday. No, it's full days for the whole time out there and small groups for the retention of it. And they learn new skills, not just the kayaking, but they learn about accepting quiet, accepting leadership, and how, how to do the certain things that relate to other things in their life. And if you can do this in this life, you can do this in that one. This is a miracle. I call this picture my miracle. And, and it takes a lot to understand why I say that. This is, her name is Latasha, like a lot of Keishas and Latashas and Marquishas in my life. She has a girlfriend named Gabby who bought into the skiing and the outdoor stuff. So she says, I'll take a try. Now, Latasha is all about hair and nails. My hair, my nails. Get my hair done and get my nails did. That's her language. And to see her in a kayak, liking it, wanting to do it more, and then, matter of fact, now she's going to be getting a job in the summertime working with DEC for some summer employment. Is a miracle. And those are the kinds of things that are life changeable and example setters for other youth. That when youngsters can break out of their comfort zone and do the next thing and work on peer attraction as opposed to peer pressure. You know, while we're camping, the fire's on, he's watching his white sneakers. And Latasha is one of my great and examples. And accomplishment, of that having a sense of Latasha. Now, I don't show the food part after this because I had to time. cut some frames. down but when you give them that they've done this well feed them feed them picnic make a ceremony out of the food really 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 make something happen that relates to this is something spectacular not just good and it wins over a, a lot of attention for the next adventure again partnerships there is a group of skiers in the United States called the National Brotherhood of Skiers. There are 85 chapters of African-American skiers, one of the largest groups of skiers. And one of the chapters happens to be in Albany. And in my need to know what's going on and try to make connections for the urban youth, I found out about the Nubian Empire Ski Club, made a partnership with them. It's difficult. I, I give it to you again. This is, this is what I like the way Cortland was coming with some real truth. There is a structure, even in the hood, where these skiers were a little bit what we call bougie compared to my kids that want to connect. So I had to bring them down. I'm like, yo, it's about connecting. It ain't about your Cadillac and your job. It's about connecting. And we were able to do that after a little bit of, of you know, tug of war. And uh, the, the slogan for them is, who says we don't? Who says African Americans and Latinos don't ski? And it's, it's the connecting. It's bringing families together. Now we've got moms that want to come out because their daughter said, I love the skiing. I went from the bunny hill to the lift in one day, mom. What? Let me go see. So we got moms coming out. We got some macaroni and cheese and potato salad being made now for the trips. Things like that. We go skiing with 50 kids 
every other Sunday in the summer just to create that connection that if you can do it outdoors in the winter, it's safe to assume you might do it in the spring and the fall. And we call our, we call our ski trips our Xbox detox. It's getting the youngsters unplugged in the winter. And the smart move about this is that when we're out there, we're doing tree identification. We're learning about some of the stuff that's important with regards to watersheds. We're, we're going, as we're driving to different places, we play a game called, you know, if you can tell me something with a Y that's in nature, they have to go that the whole way, all way through. And it's a real, real engagement with getting kids to think outside the box and be outdoors in their mind. Families, we're talking about grandparents coming out with their granddaughters and, and others to be a part of this, and we call it adventures with the E, not adventures, to be able to be schooled themselves into what it is to connect and reconnect with nature. My ski team, and I talk about teens a lot. Teens are important because, again, those are the youngsters that are looking for, now which way do I go now that I'm sophomore, almost junior in this direction in life? How do I, what is the pipeline for me other than a get-rich-quick scheme, as was, as was talked about on the panel, a get-rich-quick scheme, or somebody hearing my rap demo, or the NBA really knowing that I could play basketball. Those are the dreams that have to be demystified. Some of our, our youngsters who are locked into that. If it ain't NBA, rap, or a get-rich-quick scheme, I'm staying right here. I'm not going anywhere. And to introduce them that they can use and do something with an outdoor education and with uh, environment and with being in the outdoors is real important at an early age. That's why I like the way my tutors are doing with the third graders. The third graders are excited about acorns and what they're really about. And Ranger Rick and things like that, they'll become their friends and so they grow into that. But these youngsters here, and I'm looking at the picture and I can see, I, I, I know one youngster in there that's uh, going to school now at college and he chose wildlife management as opposed to something else. Um, one of the youngsters in the middle now is working for me as my assistant in the DEC. He worked in it. So these kids buy into this in the long wings of a pipeline. As long as they have mentors and folks helping them along the way, it's important. And seasoned volunteers. Having good volunteers that can connect with them and are willing to share their experience, strength, and hope. Not just the, not just the, the the uh, adventure that we're on, but, but sharing with them about a few things other than what the trip's about and being able to connect, that trust piece. And that's, how, that's the kind of groups we do. We go Yankee Trail and we do a large group. Some of these youngsters know each other, some of them don't. But I use the school district to help me to walk in and get a group of kids down. Again, I may go into the school district and to the school and I'll, I'll go to the principal's office who says, well, we can do this and you can see Miss so-and-so and so-and-so and she may have some kids. When I go to the home school coordinator or the detention hall, I got somebody who tells me a every, every, uh, big list of kids I can take out. So it's knowing the right connector to get the youngsters who might need to be outdoors or who, who will connect better outdoors, who can get something from being in a, a, a group operation in unity with doing things outside the box. And you can see these kids are happy. I mean, they go from never having looked at skis before to skiing and being on the lift and perfecting their stuff. We've got some kids now that are doing double diamonds as soon as they get there. We go there at 8.30 in the morning, we're there. We don't see that kid at 4 o'clock. He's gone. He's gone. He's come back, one glove lost, a broke leg or whatever. He's ready. <laughs> He's gone. He's had a ball. He's had a ball. Proud of this group here. And, and I'm talking, when I say programs, partnerships, hooks for the urban youth and pipelines. We're always directing them to something else. My boys' outdoor leadership team grew out of a an idea of, uh, uh, that I've got from my Learn About Forest program in um, Massachusetts to get a group of youngsters hooked on one thing and doing that, but growing from that through adult interaction that's positive. Not the police, not an angry boyfriend of my mom, not a, not a principal, not the homeschool coordinator, but good adult interaction and doing something with their hands. Now, I attracted, and I say, just like the Nubian Empire, I went to some folks that were building boats, and this is the Saratoga. Now, Saratoga uh, uh, in, in Albany, uh, up in state New York, is like out there as opposed to the city. But in Saratoga, they have the Antique Classic Boat Society Incorporated. Hmm. So I go there, 
And I go with my funny cap and my boat on the car, and I ask some questions about can you, will you, do you think you might want to include some urban youth in this project that you're having, you're having this opening. And they said, well, bring them along. We'll see how they can work. These kids went out there and have been out there building 10-foot wooden boats with their hands and with instructions from what they call construction coaches from the Antique Society uh, uh, doing some work with these kids that now they're doing them every Saturday inside a, one of the members' personal garage that he has a huge wood shop in. So they're out there building boats and connecting with the other folks that live in, in Gilderland that are part of the 4-H club. So you got the Albany Boys Outdoor Leadership with the 4-H club of Gilderland and with job coaches that are airplane pilots, doctors, environmentalists, other folks who are sharing and caring with these young kids as they're doing it. Big piece with this though also is that they're getting their math, their science, their woodwork that's been taken out of the schools. That's what hooked me in school. Woodwork and building and using my hands was always a big part of that. The woodworking is being done. The, the again, unstructured, this guy chose not to work on the boat or wanted to make something for his mom. So it was about mentorship and letting him allow him to do that and having the wood shop there and some mentor around him to do that with. Working with their hands, team building, and doing a lot of character building behind, again, knowing that when you're mixing a chemical that's supposed to be some kind of a, a, a epoxy, then you have to know the timing, you have to know the mixture, you have to know this chemistry. Chemistry, math, and a whole lot, and teamwork. Somebody has to hold up the fiber while they were doing that, and these kids are getting that kind of a hit and enjoying the, act, the, the idea of aquatics. And the carrot is that each one of them will get their boater's, boater's license. They're going to be going out on the 3rd of May getting their license to, 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 to operate a boat. Again, the work ethics. The, the I can do this alone without the crew. I can make sure that I'm okay without you seeing that I'm okay because I'm okay, okay. <laughs> you know? They don't have to have, have that, that outside uh, approval from their friend or their peer necessarily in some of this building. And again, a fostering the adult and youth interaction. I'm going to speed up and just talk about environmenters and establishing, establishing the genuine and positive respect for leadership using the power of nature. These are, these are my friends. These are part of the Environmental Awareness Network. And these are the brown faces that are putting a hit on what it is to draw urban youth from his block, from his comfort zone, to do some things in the outdoors. It's important, it's not that it's segregated or exclusive, but it's important to start where they stand and bring them to the professionals, bring them to the people who may know more than what we know, but to have the trust and to let them know you can do this too. So we have a cadre of volunteers as well as members of the Environmental Awareness Network for Diversity and Conservation who work along with me and some of the other folks in the group to do the next thing. Braving the Adirondacks. We live in Albany, which is close to Catskills, close to the Adirondacks, and right on the Hudson. Nobody knows about those things. You know, know what none of the kids know about the schools don't use it. So we encourage that kind of involvement. This is a group of boys that, with me, climbed two of the 46 high peaks. There are 46 high peaks in the Adirondacks. Climbed two of them in one weekend, played a football game that turned from touch to, 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 to tackle, did a canoe expedition with learning how to canoe and played some, some kind of game on the canoe, and did 2.5 miles straight up, and then 1.9 miles straight up with a camera crew of 17 delaying their progress because they were doing a PBS movie. The Adirondacks has become a big friend of some of these young people, and they've taken it to a next level. They want to backpack more. We did two, we want to do three. We want to do all the 46s. And that's their, that's their esprit de corps that's coming out of this. And uh, it's a great piece, as a matter of fact, my wife and I are leaving Saturday in order to get back on the 13th, Paul Smith College, which is a college up in the Adirondacks, the Culinary Arts and Forestry, is doing a premiere showing of this PBS documentary and inviting us up to see the, uh, the, the first product of it. Uh, these kids really did a great job that weekend. When I got done with this, I found one of those Brookstone stores. Now, they got the chairs and vibrators, and I, I sat down on that that Sunday when I got back. <laughs> but it was a great trip in that we connected with more than just the climbing. We connected with, you know, like I say, beginning, middle, ends, and, and, and going to the end and finding out that you can do more if you're exposed to more. It doesn't take you having to, 
to learn more or, or, or research more or be accepted by the group that's doing what they're doing. It's about you being exposed more to the outdoors and be exposed more to the opportunities and the options that are out there. So the canoeing, the hiking, the climbing. And this is one of my treasured pieces as far as partnerships. We've partnered with the Hudson Valley Community College and their fine arts department and those kids who like photography to create an outdoor photography club of youngsters. So the urban youth through the lens are capturing the outdoors and it's the hook that's bringing them out there and wanting to go out more. So we've got youngsters that are climbing with us, that are taking trips with us, that are setting up their own trips because they know what theme they want to go take photos. And we allow these youngsters to really, really, really express what they want, critique the, 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 uh, the shots that they take, and really come down to the hooks and the pipelines that they want to do. And this is our inside class, only for a Wednesday, everything else is outdoors. And this is the kind of kid, this is, this is a kid named Avery. This is a guy when he goes hiking, and as I say, like myself, I was the kind of a connect the dot kid, glee club material. He has brown envelopes that he has, those specimen envelopes in his, in his top pocket. And he gets laughed at by the other kids. Why you got those envelopes on? I'm going to collect things. He's, he's collecting stuff. You know? he, oh, he's collecting things out there. What are you doing, Avery? One time we took a trip to uh, the Overlook Mountain Trail, and he almost collected a beehive because he was, he was walking off the, off the beaten trail. And, uh, but Avery's a collector. And if, if Avery's not with us, it's only because he's turkey hunting with his, with his uncle or somewhere quail hunting or somewhere climbing something else or way. He's just that kind of youngster, love him. These are shots, this is taken by a 15 year old high school student of, of, the, of the Adirondacks. It's another shot taken by a 14 year old middle school kid. Now I, this is in the Adirondacks, some of my friends up there have restored farmhouses, so I look for those partnerships. Can we use your restored farmhouses? Is everything happening now? Is organic gardening is not going on in the wintertime, can we come up there? Sure brother Yusuf, come on up. Can I bring 15 boys? Well. Just don't use my plumbing. Make them use the, out, the outhouses. Okay, we're rolling. So I get up there, and we were out all day long with an interpreter taking pictures with the F-170 cameras. But that morning, as I'm putting their, their disc into my, and uploading their photos in my laptop, I'm trying to catch that morning sun coming up. So I'm out there 20 minutes, trying. they all sleep on the sleeping bags. One kid gets up. And says, Yusuf, I gotta go to the bathroom. Well, you gotta use outdoors. You remember that? Here's a flashlight. He goes outside the door. I hear the, the screen door slam. He comes right back in, grabs a camera, and gets this shot. I was out there half an hour <laughs> trying to get this shot. And this shot, and believe it or not, because our kids need affirmation, this shot, along with 20 other photos, were blown up to 18 by 24. And we we're on display at the Tupper Lake Natural History Museum of the Adirondacks. We we're on display there on Rachel Carson's 100th birthday anniversary. We did it with the group from Newcomb and some other groups that were up there in Elizabethtown. We joined those schools and showed off our wares. And each kid was able to talk about why they captured that photo and what was going on as opposed to them doing another shot. So it was great. And then we did another display at another uh, location, Skull Harry, where the audience was, um, it was, was floored in regards to the kind of photos and capturing and choices the kids were making. When you got a kid that's this mostly connected TV, you know, and he's saying, wait, well, he said, Let me, can, will this take a close-up? Try it. Just try it. And it did. It worked. And we were able to show them how to do some enhancement on the software and the computers, and they came up with this finished product. Moving on. Girls in the Clearwater. Clearwater is the floating classroom of the Adirondacks, of the Hudson River, of the whole New York in regards to science on the move. Another partnership. We, we, our young ladies who go to 15 to 17 year old camps get a chance to do some post-camp activities and coming together again, sort of like a reunion. So we're getting these youngsters from all over New York State to be on the Clearwater for what we call a three-day women's empowerment sale. And they meet, they don't know each other all the time, but they meet and they sell for three days and camp out each night. This is one of Pete Seeger's projects on, on, the, on, the, uh, at, on the Hudson. And they sail and they put out nets and they learn a lot about aquatics. And, but more than anything, they bond. And some of these youngsters bond for life. They're going to school together. They email, email pen pals and doing some things that are outside of my wildest dreams as it relates to what the purpose was for. But just to get them outdoors and to, and to be part of what the movement is to leave no child inside. And they're being introduced to women 
who have, who have jobs and who have uh, professions who are not the same that they think about. Some of them are, you know, real, real environmentalists, wildlife management people, veterinarians and things like that who are, are in charge of the, the clear water. Big piece and moving up quick is that our college tours and career launches I had by taking middle school kids. I take middle school kids to Syracuse to spend the night and learn how to pack a bag, how to sit down at a, at a, at a, at a, at a uh, restaurant because we're going to tour the whole departments in the Environmental School of Science and Forestry. And we're going to sit down and talk to colleges and I want you to know that if you sit next to the person, you might be decided to talk about how to, how to really be interviewed and how to approach someone with assertiveness is an important part of our college tours. But they get to see Paul Smith's culinary arts. They get to, you know something, you never know what hooks an urban kid. You know what most of our kids get hooked to? And my wife probably laughed at this. In the, in the, in the cafeterias, they have the, the plexiglass cereal where they can see the Fruit Loops. You never know what hits them. I, you never know what gets them. It's the Fruit Loops in the cafeteria that attracted them to want to go back again. Okay. But it works, and it gets them back. I had some young ladies that came in that wanted to dance, and they danced, but they danced their way all the way to the, the African American History Month Black Extravaganza dancing for the School of Environmental um, Science and Forestry. One young lady is going to school Hudson Valley now with photography as a result of those kinds of trips. And we take them to the departments. This is at SUNY Environmental School of Science and Forestry where paper science and bioprocessing engineering is a big part of what their mission is about. Now, I've got a youngster I met some years ago in family court when I was doing gang prevention. Took him to camp, went to camp again, became camp of the session, came back, volunteered for two weeks, grew up, and went to the 15 to 17 year old camp, became camp of the session. I gave him a job in food service in the camp for the summer. Maxed out on that. He got a scholar, took him to international papers to see, to see trees. He loved trees. What took a kid off the block? from family court with a pins petition into loving trees was just exposure and more of it, more of it. Lo and behold, this kid is now, this kid, <laughs> Rayshawn is nineteen twenty now, is, is in Hudson Valley with a full scholarship to environmental school and science and forestry from the pulp and paper industry. Just he had to build his math up because his first six months will be in school at, 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 at ESF will be in Brazil, learning bioprocessing engineering. This is one of the exchange students there that invited him to do so. These are my hard hats. Hard heads, hard hats. These are my boys. But they're out there learning everything about trees, taking it, growing it, um, shades intolerant, all the th things about trees, from taking it down to cutting it at nine foot logs and debarking it and putting it through the whole process of paper making, all the way to shrink wrap and quality control or ream of paper. They know the process, they've seen it, and they learn it. The attraction, what's behind them here, is the bat cave. It used to be a graphite mine for international papers that they dug in, and bats go in there and house. So in order to get a trip started, I said, we're going to international papers, and they've got a bat cave. Where are you going? Can I win I sign, Brother Yusuf? You, know, you too, shorty big George? Yeah, me too. Yeah. So we were able to use hooks to get the youngsters out there, and once they're out there, they're engaged, and they become more engaged as time goes on. I'm gonna move quick, because this is important for them. Kids like stuff. My blue hat, my red vest, my, my stuff is related to the trip and it, and it leads into retention and stuff like that, particularly urban kids. The partnership, the Alliance of Community Trees, national program, Neighborwoods is a big part. Neighborwoods from the Alliance of Community Trees. Ask me, do you think your kids wanna get involved with us breaking the Guinness Book of Records of most trees planted by youth in one hour? Because we've got Atlanta, Georgia, we've got Maine, we've got you in Albany. We want to get all these kids at the same hour planting trees and break the Guinness Book of Records. Lo and behold, we did it in 2005. And these kids are recorded in the Guinness Book of Records for having been a part of planting the most trees planted by youth in one hour. These, these 15 youngsters with me planted 60 trees in 60 minutes and were able to do some real bonding as they were doing it and some real learning. Bronx River Alliance, again, partnerships. I always think partnerships because everything's not in the school, and we expect that. Some parents expect that everything's going to be gotten in the school. Everything's going to be gotten in, in, in the Boys and Girls Club after school when there's a waiting list or there's mayhem going on there or there's territory issues in Boys and Girls Clubs or other places or that the counselors are more college 
I don't know how to put it this way, but they're not connecting with the kids, even though they have the jobs as program coordinators, computer room runners. They, they don't connect with the kids in a real way. So the Bronx River Alliance in the city of New York, we take the kids from Albany down to the city to learn more about and accept what's going on in their backyard. Bronx River, we do our cleanup in the Bronx River Alliance by planting trees along the East River and the Bronx River for the corrosion that's happening along the riverbanks. Kids get a hit on that. They know what it's about. They have an orientation, and they're willing to plant trees. And we're investing in our future environmental leaders by doing so. Connecting again. And this is, I'll, I'll say without hesitation, I worked gang prevention quite a while. There were trips that I took just for the youngsters who had parents that were incarcerated in correctional facilities. Just that group. Right now, the Big Brothers Big Sisters has adopted that philosophy. They have a whole program around connecting with youth who's, who's Moms or dads are incarcerated. It's a reality. And if you don't put them into some kind of a self-esteem about that or a group around that, they're going to get lost with not feeling shame, not knowing how to look up, and, and going inside instead of coming outside with what their pain's about. So we connected fathers with sons on a Father's Day, canoeing behind the Bronx Zoo. We canoe through the Bronx Zoo, through the Botanical Gardens, in a place that like Huckleberry Finn's long, long for it. Never knew it was there. I drove the, the trains and the trolley cars and things like that there. Never knew that behind there there were waterfalls and that I could connect dads with, 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 with their sons in doing a trip. And we did a night hike the night before that and stayed and camped in Alley Pond Park and then went uptown and came all the way five miles down the river behind the Bronx Zoo through the Botanical Garden. But the big piece was connecting, connecting with dads and connecting with sons and doing the kind of things that were off the pocket. In closing, when I build the things, I try to make connections that are lifelong and get kids involved in seeing that they can do this on their own, that there's a bigger world out there. A sense of place is New York. It's not your block that you live on. A sense of place is the United States. We were able to make a partnership with the Sierra Club and the Sierra Foundation last year. And the school district did, had no clue. So I co-authored a, a grant with them for the Building Bridges to the Outdoors. And it's, again, it's a principle. How do you stretch the person's mind to see something beyond their wildest dreams? So national parks were important. We were able to get four, four, I'm kidding, four youngsters from the high school had been to camp. Two of them are working in our tutor program. One is doing great with science and a real, real kid with a lot of support. And take them through a program with the Yosemite Institute and the wild link and go to Yosemite Park for 10 days. And we had a ball with these kids. Now, a hook. Kids going to Yosemite. For me, going to Yosemite was great. But kids going to Yosemite, what hooked them was that they were going with Crenshaw High School from LA, an East LA high school, where the other groups of four and four youngsters that were going as a, as a team of three high schools. But Crenshaw High School is where Baby Boy was made. The Crips and the Bloods are, are, are on a stand down in a, in a truce there. You've got a Crip high school in a blood community. You might not understand that. They do. They do. And it's working. It's a campus that's beautiful. Synergy going on. 50 people in an eco club hiking and biking every day as part of their curriculum. Building gardens. Hydroponics on the roof. Things like that are going on inside the school through the dean of boys, that the dean of the school, who's also a member of the Sierra Club and part of the, the group that I belong to with Richard Louvre and the Children Nations Network. So we got these youngsters out there, and this is the whole group of East LA High School, Crenshaw High School, and Albany High School kids who did an excellent job of bonding and producing a real, real, real connection to the outdoors that was beyond their wildest dreams. I, I thought that taking them to Yosemite was just like going to any national park. or any, it, was be, it was beautiful. And the beautiful part about it is, is that for four days, they were taken away from me and my wife and the other chaperones by the Yosemite Institute and done backcountry stuff that I'll give the website. They're online. Their whole journal entry and all their pictures and things are online. But they were able to be taken away, and we were able to enjoy my new camera, <laughs> the waterfalls, you know, a walk to Mirror Lake, a lunch at a Wani hotel and have a great time. And when they came back, I witnessed youngsters that were 15 and 16 grow up two years in front of my face, 
having done some team building, having met the Buffalo soldiers who were part of the African-American cavalry who protected the National Park, who they had no clue about that history, who tore them up and then built them back up again as they progressed through their self-esteem and what they were about as being connected to the park. It was a great experience and a great adventure for them and for me to know that we can broaden our scope. Then my next trip, I want to go to the Everglades in, 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 in Florida with a group of 15 youngsters. I would love to do that and stretch them out and get them prepared for that. So it's connecting with our youth and doing things like the Learn About Forest and, and grants and looking for them. The Learn About Forest program, the More Kids in the Woods, the Young Women at the Helm, our outdoor leadership group. Uh, venturing Clues, this Boy Scouts of America has got a high affirmation of scouting now called Venturing, where, where kids can pick their own topic that they want to do, and that their Venturing Crew will endorse that. There's a lot of all-day programs that are out there, and Saturday and extended school day programs that the school districts are looking for to harness the energy that at 3 o'clock can go any way it wants to go until 6 or 9 when someone comes home or when someone doesn't come home without urban youth. So harnessing that time and looking at that time and looking at Saturdays as the adventure day is a real important thing when it comes down to that. I know, and in my closing, I know that there is a lot of folks in the school districts who think that time spent outdoors is a waste of time that could be better spent on academics. I say leave no child inside. Get them outdoors. The health the smartness, the creativity, the imagination, the will to discover and explore that's needed for our youngsters to go back into the schools and master what they have to master or do or become willing to find the will to be average and okay with it is important when you got a youngster outdoors waking up. I've seen youngsters wake up earlier than I do on a three-day camp out having set up tents the night before in rain and get out there and do the team building that makes the rain go away. There's team building now. The rain's not there. And they wake up in the morning and they smell the oatmeal that we've got some cinnamon and sugar in, getting ready to feed them in, and they're in heaven. They're ready to go six miles, nine miles up any mountain because they're in a different place. They're in a different world. They've, they've expressed themselves to each other and to the group as a whole that we can do this and get something out of it and bring back to a group, and they call them chumps, to a group of chumps back at school who chose not to come. That's how they work in it. They flip it in regards to what is important and what's not important. So it's not about having a knot in your pocket or knowing somebody who's going to put you down with something and get you rich quick on, on the corner. It's about really, really engaging in outdoor activity and finding a way to have not just quality of life issues that come out of it, because you know, I've seen some young girls who got pink Timberlands and pink hoodies that match. And that's all they know about Timberlands is that it matches my, my hoodie. <laughs> you know, but now our kids know that Patagonia and, 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 and Keen Shoes and, and all, the, all the North Face has an aim and a purpose. They go skiing, they go snowshoeing, they go ice fishing, and they put this fleece on it. So they understand it now more than just a fashion statement or someone that's doing something for them and making a whole lot of money off of them but not giving back. They know how to hike. They know how to backpack. They know how to conserve. They know how to really think about renewable energy in a conscious way because they learn about the value of an urban tree and what it's doing. They're learning this and they're teaching it to other youngsters that are three, third, fourth, and fifth graders. And they're connecting in a big way. This is in New York and this is being spread, but it's a hit that's important because it needs to be really, really understood that if a youngster's not exposed, he's not going to know. And the more exposure you get him, someone asked the question, when does it start and how much does it have? Is there's not enough being done to get kids outdoors as much, as much as we can, even if it's just outdoors. Some of our parents say, well, you can't go outside. Open the door. Go out there with them. Get a bike. Get a tandem bike. You know, uh, find out there's some free kayak clinics that are going on. Find out a way to be able to connect with your youngster and let the door open again. I, can, I, I, I long for the days before I joined the Army when my mom would say, just go outdoors so the lights come on. Okay, I'm going. And my wife would attest to this. In high school, my brothers used to fail at classes and get summer school. I used to lie and say I failed. And I got to go to summer school so I could be in the reservoir with my raft. So I'm leaving every morning, going to school. Not going to school. To the reservoir. I did that and, and, until my dad found out. And then he put me outdoors with a rake. 
But it's important to have unstructured things and, and, and connections with, with adults that are positive but in, out, in the outdoors. It's important to see that our youngsters are spending so much time behind the TV, these dangerous, dangerous video games that they're doing, these, these, these mayhem monsters that they're being addicted to. Now they're online connected with others, not necessarily doing it nationwide with each other. All those things are, have its place. But to get a youngster to have balance and to have real, real, realness in his life is to get him outdoors, to leave no child inside, to make sure that the movement moves and that we get things done. And thank you for letting me share. I really appreciate the audience.